On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union sent shockwaves around the world when they used a military ICBM booster rocket to launch a 100-kilogram satellite called Sputnik into Earth orbit. This event spawned a political and technological race between the superpowers by opening up space as a potentially terrifying new theater in which communist and democratic countries could compete. This race proved to be the ultimate arena to determine the superior political philosophy. The race between the United States and Soviet Union throughout the 1960s to land a man on the moon was by far the most dangerous and difficult venture in which humankind had ever embarked. Landing men on the moon's surface by the United States on July 20th, 1969 represented the greatest technological achievement in the history of humanity. Recently declassified information released by the former Soviet Union and the United States reveals shocking new evidence of haphazard safety precautions, Soviet government cover-ups, and the loss of hundreds of lives never reported before. This program presents the true and previously untold story behind the race to the moon, a race that both sides were determined to win at any cost. In 1954, representatives from over 70 nations gathered to establish a global scientific venture called the International Geophysical Year. Over 30,000 scientists agreed to cooperate in the investigation of the Earth and its environment. During this gathering, the American contingency promised to launch the first satellite into space by late 1958 as a part of this scientific venture. The space effort was dubbed Project Orbiter, and a Navy Vanguard rocket was planned to be the means for getting the premier satellite into orbit. On October 4, 1957, as I recall, the Russians uh, launched a fairly heavy object uh, into orbit, and that caught us really by surprise. A Vanguard project had gotten underway in 1955, as I recall it, uh, part of the IGY program, International Geophysical Year program, but it wasn't anywhere near uh, ready. Uh, they had, I think, uh, scheduled some launches late that year, that is in 1958, but uh, it wasn't clear that they were going to be able to fly them. The Sputnik satellite carried not only a radio transmitter that allowed it to be tracked, but also a variety of instruments designed to measure the density of the upper atmosphere. People around the world were plunged into a state of shock and dismay, since the Soviet payload could just as well have been a nuclear warhead that could be delivered to anywhere on the planet. This event drastically transformed the political, military, and psychological climate around the world and served to heighten the division between democracy and communism. Uh, there was a sense of a very, very major threat uh, from uh, the country of Russia at the time, Soviet Union, uh, in, in a military sense. Uh, and, and we were beginning the, to see all of the manifestations of the Cold War. And the space theater, a new one to people, uh, was begun to be seen as an area of competition between the major powers, that is the United States and Soviet Union. Uh, and in that context, I think there was a great deal of fear that the, uh, that the Soviet Union had a big head start on us. The hysteria and fear created by the Soviet space accomplishment prompted President Eisenhower to address the American public in an attempt to reduce the resulting anxiety. Vanguard, for the reasons indicated, has not had equal priority with that accorded our ballistic missile work. Speed of progress in the satellite project cannot be taken as an index of our progress in ballistic missile work. Our satellite program has never been conducted as a race with other nations. Rather, it has been carefully scheduled as part of the scientific work of the International Geophysical Year. We are, therefore, carrying the program forward in keeping with our arrangements with the international scientific community. He was not a space cadet. He used to say, 
is he looked over his shoulder and he said, you know, Keith, that moon's been there a long time. It's going to be there a great many eons yet. And we'll get there one day, but it isn't necessary we break our necks and break the budget to get there now. Less than a month after the first Sputnik satellite was launched into orbit, and even before the furor over the launch had died down, the Soviets launched a second Sputnik, this time ferrying a living passenger, a dog named Laika. However, their technology was not yet capable of bringing the dog back alive, and Laika died in orbit a few days later. The launch of the Vanguard rocket with only a grapefruit-sized satellite was pushed forward almost a full year by the surprised American government in an attempt to match the Soviet technology in space. Hundreds of reporters from around the world were present at the historic launch in December 1957. The launch attempt failed miserably and embarrassed the Americans tremendously. The Americans were floundering with their space technology and another Vanguard launch failed the following month. It befell upon Dr. Werner von Braun and the U.S. Army to devise a rocket that could save the honor of America. On January 31, 1958, von Braun's rocket, the Jupiter C, successfully carried a satellite into orbit and brought America into space to join their rivals. Over the next two years, the Soviets launched their third Sputnik into orbit with a payload that weighed over a ton and also sent several probes to explore the moon, sending back the first pictures of the backside of the lunar surface. The Soviets had succeeded in forcing the world to acknowledge their superiority in every technological aspect of space exploration over the Americans. The environment was very threatening, uh, very challenging, and a sense that the space theater was going to be very, very important to the outcome or the results of uh, the Cold War in order to help set uh, the perceptions around the world about uh, which power and which system, which country and which system were stronger and which would prevail. On December 17, 1958, Eisenhower created NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, a civilian space agency. NASA was given full authority to oversee all manned and unmanned American space activities. It became clear to both the United States and Soviet Union in the late 1950s that the next step into space would be with men. Several highly trained military jet test pilots were chosen by both nations to defend the honor of their respective country and literally go where no man had gone before in the name of their flag and country. The Americans were called astronauts and all of them were highly publicized in the press. In sharp contrast, the Soviets were called cosmonauts and everything about them was kept top secret, even the number of men chosen and their names. None of these new cosmonauts were even able to tell their families what they did. Facts only recently uncovered reveal just how much the Kremlin interfered with the Soviet space agency. The setting of space firsts and records took priority over men's lives, much to the disdain of the head of the Soviet space agency, Sergei Korolev. As an example, in October 1960, a huge new booster rocket appeared to malfunction and just sat on the launch pad after it was supposed to take off. Instead of taking safety precautions, the Kremlin ordered the launch director and engineers to fix the problem immediately and get the rocket launched that day. With over 165 men inspecting the rocket, including the launch director, it suddenly blew up in a huge ball of fire and instantly killed everyone near the rocket. Rumors persist that this was an early manned launched attempt and that a cosmonaut was on board. Amazingly, this historic tragedy was never officially confirmed by the Soviet government. On April 12, 1961, the Soviets were once again successful in creating a storm of excitement all over the world when they announced the successful launch and orbit of the first man into space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin.
Gagarin made a single orbit around the Earth during his flight that lasted about 108 minutes. His spacecraft was automatically maneuvered by control engineers on the ground, and he spent most of his time noting his experience of weightlessness. Upon re-entry, Gagarin jumped out of his capsule at about 3,000 meters and parachuted to safety, as the Soviets had not yet developed the technology for a survivable ground landing, a fact not even admitted by the Soviets until 1978. Recently released documents from the state archives of the Kremlin now indicate that Gagarin was not the first cosmonaut to return from space. Another cosmonaut, Vladimir Ilushin, the son of a famous Soviet aircraft designer, had previously returned from space alive, but was in very bad shape. Apparently the Soviet authorities felt that they could not possibly present him to the public as a returning hero in such poor condition. As a result, the Soviet government removed all pictures taken of him and buried all details of the flight until recently. The heroic efforts of such a brave cosmonaut was not to be acknowledged by the world. Other uncovered Kremlin secrets also indicate that as many as seven cosmonauts were killed in rocket explosions and other space flight attempts prior to Gagarin's flight. Cosmonauts Lodovsky, Shiborin, Mitkov, Dolgov, Belakonev, Kachur, and Grachev were never honored as pioneers who gave their lives attempting to reach space and will remain as only names in a previously secret state archive list of cosmonauts who died in rocket accidents. Between 1959 and 1961, the Soviet Union simply did not allow for the release of any facts that would reflect negatively on their space agency which was itself shrouded in secrecy. Khrushchev's concern was not for any individual cosmonaut, but for the status of his country in the theater of world opinion and in setting space firsts. Khrushchev also bragged that the Soviet Union was not only going to establish nuclear missile bases in orbit around the Earth, but also had plans to establish military colonies on the moon as well. Positive perceptions of communist philosophy was at its peak. So we had an environment of uh, competition uh, in space that was really part of a larger competition that was mostly military and political in nature. Uh, and uh, it was a general sense of threat and uh, unease and uncertainty about where this whole thing was going to go. People had images of uh, bombs and vehicles of various kinds flying overhead all the time and it was uh, it was a genuine threat to the uh, to the attitudes and psyche of uh, people in our country and I'm sure people in the Soviet Union at the time. When John Kennedy became the president he also had to publicly try to reduce the fear of the American public that the American Space Agency was weak and without direction, especially after Gagarin's flight. I do not regard the first man in space as a sign of the weakening of the, uh, of the uh, free world. But I do regard the total mobilization of men and uh, things for the service of the communist bloc over the last years as a source of great danger to us. And I would say we're going to have to live with that danger and hazard uh, through much of the rest of this century. Some of Kennedy's advisors turned up the heat on von Braun to get Americans into space in an attempt to catch up to the Soviets at any cost. Von Braun responded that crash programs and cheap publicity stunts like those chosen by the Soviets were doomed to failure, and that America should commit itself to a systematic and long-term effort in space exploration. They kept worrying themselves that we were going to do the wrong thing, shoot ourselves in the foot, that we were going to create a big political 
problem for Kennedy, that we'd kill somebody or that we would not know what we were doing, that it was a fly-by-night uh, operation. I mean, all, nat all good questions. So we were continuously having to prove that. The best compromise von Braun could offer was a suborbital flight on a very reliable ballistic missile named Redstone. On May 5th, 1961, astronaut Alan Shepard became the first American in space on a 15-minute flight that reached an altitude of 115 miles. This is Freedom 7. The fuel is go 1.2G. Cabin at 14 PSI. Oxygen is go. Cabin pressure is holding at 5.5. .5. After Shepard's flight, Kennedy pointedly asked von Braun and his closest scientific advisors what America could do to achieve prominence in space and beat the Soviet Union at their own game. Given the Soviets' tremendous head start in space, the scientists told Kennedy that the only task America could possibly accomplish before the Soviets was a manned lunar landing. By mid-May of 1961, Kennedy had his fill of embarrassing setbacks in the American Space Agency and was fed up with Soviet threats and bellicose claims of Soviet superiority in space. Kennedy then challenged the Soviet Union to the most historic race in human history, to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Kennedy's rhetoric emphasized that this venture was to prove that freedom and democracy had to prevail and overcome the evil intentions of the sinister Soviet Empire. For the eyes of the world, now look into space, to the moon, and to the planets beyond. And we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom and peace. We have vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. The Soviet threat, if you will, in the Cold War uh, provided an enormous motivation for those of us that were in the NASA program. Uh, personally, I looked upon this as just another battle in the Cold War. Uh, my friends were fighting in Vietnam. I happened to be uh, fighting a, a more peaceful uh, uh, war in space. And there was uh, an enormous motivation on the part of everybody uh, to overcome the leadership that the Soviets had demonstrated in space and to, uh, to get to the moon first. We had, the, we had the blank check, we had the priority, and Congress thought we were a bunch of nuts, so they didn't want to have anything to do with it, and that was the best favor they could do for us, just stay out of it. Congressional support was really very good. Uh, as a matter of fact, they were pushing us. I don't think in my 20 months there that I ever had a budget proposed to them uh, that they didn't want to add something to. Uh, my stock answer was, I have uh, studied this, we have presented you with a budget which is what we think we can usefully use. If we need any more, you may be certain I'll come right back to you. Oh, they gave us more freedom because they didn't really understand what we had to do and how, what, how far reaching it was. And, and so the bureaucracy uh, took forever to catch up with us. I mean, we were all running, man. And we zoom, seven days a week. 
all our waking hours. And, 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 and I'm hiring people. Shit, I'm hiring people like crazy. In my organization, everybody else is doing the same thing. By the end of 1961, the Americans were still struggling and only able to launch another suborbital flight with astronaut Gus Grissom. The Soviets, on the other hand, put cosmonaut German Titov in Earth orbit for an entire day and 16 revolutions. Sergei Korolev, the head of the Soviet Space Agency, was the man directly responsible for the design, construction, and launching of all Soviet rockets, including those of Gagarin and Titov. Korolev was the chief designer of ballistic missiles under Stalin, and he was the Soviet's top secret weapon in the space race. However, due to Khrushchev's paranoia and need for total secrecy, Korolev was never to be recognized for his contribution to space exploration during his lifetime. The world was unaware of Korolev and his achievements as the head of the Soviet Space Agency. In fact, the Nobel Prize Committee wanted to nominate the chief Soviet rocket designer responsible for the Gagarin and Titov flights as a way to acknowledge that person's brilliance. When the committee asked Khrushchev what individual was responsible for the design of the Soviet rockets, he replied, the Soviet people. As for the Americans, the only rocket booster powerful enough to put a man into orbit was a converted ICBM called Atlas. The Atlas was used in the Mercury program, and the Atlas was, of course, a, uh, uh, an original uh, ICBM weapon system that was developed by the Air Force. It was a very flimsy, still is a rather flimsy vehicle. The actual systems we had at the time uh, were relatively fragile and relatively unreliable. Uh, I remember looking at film of, uh, of launches, frankly, most of which seemed to end up in a disaster rather than a successful uh, launch to space. went up to the top of Hangar S where we had our crew quarters at the Cape. Someone said, there was an Atlas launch. Hey, yeah, I'll go up and see one. He got off the pad about 100 feet and my room blew. So we weren't exactly <laughs> great fans of Atlas. We, uh, when we flew on Atlas, uh, it was blowing up with great regularity. And we grounded uh, the Atlas before my flight so we wouldn't hear about any more blow-ups for a while. Astronaut John Glenn was originally scheduled to make a forgettable third suborbital spaceflight. However, with the tremendous pressure put on the Americans by the Soviet successes, NASA felt the time had come to send the first American into orbit. Glenn went up for three revolutions on February 20th, 1962. John Glenn's success restored some of the self-respect that Americans had lost since the beginning of the space competition with the Soviets. The Americans were still trailing the Soviets, but Glenn's success finally landed the Americans on the same playing field and within striking distance of the moon. There followed a succession of three more solo American flights over the following 15 months, which included the flight of Scott Carpenter, Wally Schirra, and Gordon Cooper. Cooper's flight was the longest of the solo Mercury missions, lasting about a day. 
Well, everything was new, as we called it, every day was no G whiz day. Because we didn't know really what to expect in space and what we'd find. And, uh, we didn't know what the results would be on a lot of these things, so there were a lot of surprises. But each time we, we found out something, it put another peg in the board for us to know to move from. So we were beginning to get a little sense that we were doing things right, that we were getting better all the time. And that was indeed the, the objective of NASA in those days. Push the state of art, the art as hard as you could, but don't waste your muscle. In August 1962, the Soviets raised the bar again by not only placing cosmonauts in space for a much longer time than the Americans, but by sending two spacecraft for a planned rendezvous. Cosmonaut Andrea Nikolaev in Vostok 3 met briefly in space with cosmonaut Pavel Popovich in Vostok 4. In reality, neither spacecraft had the ability to change orbit to effect a proper rendezvous. But the event was hailed in the press as the first rendezvous on the road to the moon. In what many people considered a publicity stunt, the Soviets launched the first woman cosmonaut, Valentina Tereshkova, to orbit the Earth for three full days in June of 1963. While in orbit, she rendezvoused with another cosmonaut, Valery Baikovsky. The publicity of the first woman sent into space eclipsed a second dual rendezvous and solar record of four days and 81 revolutions set by Baikovsky. Literally millions of Soviets rallied to celebrate their leadership in space. By late 1963, President Kennedy realizing the incredible scope and cost of a trip to the moon, as well as recognizing the leadership position held by the Soviets at that time, made an almost unbelievable offer to the Soviets during an assembly of the United Nations. Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts in the regulation and exploration of space. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon. Why, therefore, should man's first flight to the moon be a matter of national competition? Why should the United States and the Soviet Union, in preparing for such expeditions, become involved in immense duplications of research, construction, and expenditure. The Soviets were just as shocked as the American public at such a conciliatory and friendly offer. However, the Kennedy speech was viewed by Khrushchev as a show of weakness on America's part, and only served to strengthen Khrushchev's resolve to continue the race to the moon and to direct all of his country's resources to achieve that end. The Soviets realized early on that a flight to the lunar surface would require a minimum crew of three. On October 12, 1964, before the United States could launch their two-man spacecraft Gemini, the Soviets redesigned their two-man capsule and launched it with three cosmonauts, Vladimir Komarov, Boris Yegorov, and Konstantin Fyoktistov. This flight lasted for about a day and 16 orbits. This was the first flight that the crew did not wear spacesuits. With Khrushchev's win at any cost philosophy, the only way three people could fit in a capsule originally designed and built for two was to have the cosmonauts risk flying without spacesuits. 
This very dangerous move paid off and further fueled the fears that the Soviets would be the first to reach the moon. The Soviet competition, I think, uh, was a great, great motivation for the American space program. And although, uh, as uh, a part of that program, I was not aware of the details of the Soviet program, and I didn't understand exactly where they were all the time, none of us did, we all knew they were very competent, they were very motivated, and that the resources of that country were totally dedicated to, uh, to accomplishing the goal, which, which was to beat us to the moon. So although we weren't, at least I was not aware of it on a day-to-day -day basis, we were certainly aware of the fact that they were competent and, and prepared to uh, do whatever it took to win. At the height of the Cold War on March 18, 1965, the Soviets launched cosmonauts Pavel Bolyayev and Alexei Leonov on a mission that would see the first man exit a spacecraft, adding to their already massive list of space records. The main objective was to uh, come out into uh, outer space, and in this connection there was the task to test the airlock system, to test the space suit, and generally speaking to uh, find out how man would uh, act and react in uh, outer space to overstep the psychological barrier which uh, we had no uh, knowledge of, uh, thank goodness. And this we did and now I can say uh, with assurance that um, it is possible to live and to work in outer space. After a flawless 10-minute spacewalk, Leonov ran into severe trouble when he tried to re-enter the capsule. The effects of weightlessness in outer space had not been properly taken into account in the design of his spacesuit, which ballooned out and made his return back into the spacecraft almost impossible. Leonov was close to death when he finally squeezed back through the airlock. As events ultimately unfolded, this flight marked the end of Soviet dominance in space. Shortly after Leonov's mission, the United States began flights with their two-man spacecraft Gemini and firmly assumed the leading role in space exploration by breaking all Soviet space records. Project Gemini was conceived to bridge the gap between the solo Mercury missions and the moon missions of Apollo. Newly invented equipment and technology had to be tested astronauts had to be trained, rendezvous and docking maneuvers had to be refined, and ground crews had to gain valuable experience. You got to remember Mercury was an Im not a maneuverable vehicle. It could go up and come down and that's all. It had no maneuvering capability. So that was the first thing we wanted to do was maneuver. The second thing we wanted to do was could it go, could it go find somebody up there? Could it go do a job up there? Could it go rendezvous with something? Could it go dock with something? Could it, could you attach a, 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 a rocket to it and go to someplace else? Those were all the things we were thinking about when we came to Germany. The Gemini program objectives were to prove out that we could do all the operational things we had to do to be able to do the lunar landing. So Gus Grissom and I were on uh, Gemini 3, the first uh, flight of the Gemini. It's, uh, it was to prove that we could uh, do uh, maneuvers in space, manual maneuvers in space, and also to prove out the lifting reentry, and we proved it out. We believe that the flight of Grissom and Young is a new national achievement for the United States. They are a further step in the storming of outer space. And we certainly congratulate our colleagues Grissom and Young with this wonderful space flight. And I think uh, one of the things that the public sometimes don't really know is the fact that 
in the midst of all this Cold War, where you had two countries that were right at one another's throats and had missiles sitting on each side ready to lob at one another, each country was encouraging its cosmonauts and its astronauts to work together, and we did. We communicated together. We had good friends amongst the other group. It was a real competition, like on a football field, but, but uh, still there was a lot of friendship, too. Anytime new technology is tested, a level of uncertainty is involved. As expected, the 10 man flights of Project Gemini experienced various and sundry equipment failures of all sorts that endangered the lives of several astronauts. Given the furious race-like pace and conditions, it was only a matter of luck and good fortune that no one was killed. We had a lot of problems with it. We had fuel cell problems, we had thruster problems, we had guidance problems, we had radar problems. We didn't know how to do EVAs. We didn't know the, uh, the, the necessity for handholds and positioning uh, systems to hold crews in place. We struggled with that. So if we hadn't have done it, we wouldn't have had the operational experience to go to the moon. And, uh, that, that experience was critical. There are people within the net program at NASA that didn't think it was critical, but they don't know anything about how human beings work together and how they have to interact and what experience they have to gain to do things. So I'm not sure the general public needs to know about that either. <laughs> I mean, but it was important. If we hadn't have done it, we would never have been able to land on the moon in 1969. By the end of Project Gemini, the Soviet Union's dream of a manned mission to the moon was rapidly growing dim. A Soviet mission was not even launched following Leonov's spacewalk flight up to the end of Gemini 20 months later. It seemed incredible that during Project Gemini the whole landscape and competition in space could have changed so dramatically. For over 30 years, the secret behind the decline of the Soviet Space Agency was heavily guarded. It has only now become known that their chief designer and head, Sergei Korolev, suddenly died in January 1966 and left the Soviet moon effort in a shambles. Korolev never groomed a successor, and that resulted in a leadership power vacuum in the Soviet space agency. There was simply no leader in the Soviet space agency that could carry on what Korolev had begun. However, the Soviets were still interested in a lunar landing. I had a suspicion that they were wanted to go to the moon because they came over here and I showed General Bergevoy how to fly in a command module in the Apollo program, but he was interested only, he and his uh, friends were only interested in the lunar landing training vehicle and they wanted to see the ejection shots of the, you know, we lost a couple of lunar landing, three lunar landing train vehicles. He wanted to see how people were jumping out. So I can't imagine why you'd be interested in that kind of thing unless you're intending to land on the moon. Come to find out that's exactly what they wanted to do was land on the moon. A three-man American Apollo capsule was slated to be the vehicle to carry the first crew to the moon. As with the Mercury and Gemini capsules that preceded it, the Apollo capsule was designed to use a 100% oxygen atmosphere along with highly flammable intricate materials. The speed of the space race had prevented long-term safety precautions and necessary testing to be conducted on any of the capsules. The law of averages finally caught up with the American Space Agency during an Apollo capsule test on the ground. Tragically, three astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, were in the capsule when an electrical spark caused an explosive fire that killed all three astronauts within seconds. After the fire, I don't think we would have continued had we not made the commitment. The country made the commitment and they would have looked like a bunch of gooks if they hadn't continued on in the eyes of the world and in their competitive position with the, in the Cold War. There was something like 1,900 changes that were looked at after the Apollo fire and the Apollo program made 1,300 of them. 
it wasn't only in just improving the fire fireproof ability of the command module. There were many changes made in the lunar module and many changes made in the overall configuration of the command module like the outward opening hatch and, uh, and of course re completely redid the wiring in the vehicle from being very uh, hazardous to more conventional uh, aircraft bundle wiring and, and it worked out fine. With the American space program stalled for the foreseeable future, the Soviets became filled with renewed confidence that they might just have a chance at winning the race to the moon. Cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov was launched three months to the day of the Apollo fire in a newly designed and enlarged spacecraft, Soyuz 1. Unfortunately, the law of averages also caught up with the Soviets as well. There were several design flaws and malfunctions in the capsule during Komarov's flight that required an emergency return. The spacecraft began to tumble out of control during re-entry, making the parachutes tangle and collapse upon deployment. Komarov's spacecraft came in like a fireball and hit the Earth at 500 kilometers an hour, killing him instantly upon impact. Unlike previous Soviet disasters with the ensuing government cover-ups, the Soviet effort to go to the moon halted for a year of investigations and a reassessment of their space agency's direction. It was strongly feared that a Soviet manned mission launched on October 25, 1968 with cosmonaut Georgi Beregovoy was intended to be a translunar flight. The Soviets were already well known to surprise the world and might come up with a last-ditch effort to pull off another space first. As it turned out, Beregovoy did nothing unexpected. The fear of a Soviet moonshot proved to be groundless. Von Braun knew full well that any manned mission to the moon would require the development of a huge rocket booster to carry a crew and return vehicle. The success of the entire American Space Agency was placed squarely on Von Braun's shoulders. He responded with a Saturn V rocket, by far the most complex piece of machinery ever built. It had over six million parts and was as tall as a 40-story building. The first manned flight of this behemoth was decided to be the Apollo 8 mission that would loop around the moon. This plan was kept secret until the last possible moment. Apollo 8 had its mission changed in August when NASA learned that the Soviets were planning a lunar flyby before the end of 1968. And so we were uh, abruptly changed from a, uh, a Earth orbital mission. And when you stop to think about it, I, I still marvel at the fact that here was the first manned Saturn V, uh, the first time to the moon, uh, so many firsts in this thing, In trying to keep up with the Americans, the Soviets secretly built a huge rocket called N-1. This booster would be necessary to send a manned mission to the moon. However, without Korolev at the helm, there were several design problems that were never resolved. Very uh, few people uh, remember that in parallel with this American uh, Apollo program, Soviets uh, attempted uh, to have their own program. But this uh, Soviet program on uh, kind of uh, counterpart to American Apollo, it failed. It failed because uh, the large ra rocket, uh, Russian counterpart to Saturn V, exploded several times, even without getting chance to, to uh, take off the launching site. Tragic consequences at launch attempts killed dozens more Soviet engineers. At that point, 
the Soviets simply dropped out of the space race to the moon. You can call it naivete or what. I just never doubted that we were going to make it to the moon. The only question that I had was whether we were going to get there ahead of the Russians. And that was the, uh, to me, that was the uh, $64 question. But uh, it, it turned out we, we, we did. On July 20th, 1969, the greatest race in history came to an end when the Apollo 11 lunar lander reached the moon's surface. Astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped out of their spacecraft and into the history books. Millions of people around the world watched on television in complete awe at the American technology. As Kennedy desired in his speech, a flag of freedom and democracy was planted on the moon that day, not a hostile flag of conquest for the communist Soviet empire. The world would finally acknowledge the clear superiority of the democratic American technology over the Soviets. The moment American landed on the moon and American astronaut uh, uh, left his footprint the Soviet government decided that the important significance of continuing these huge efforts, multi-billion dollar effort uh, in Soviet Union, just evaporated. And we decided, yes, silently we uh, uh, admitted that we lost uh, the race for the moon. For the United States, the space race mobilized talents and pooled resources in an unprecedented manner. It was the largest single peacetime concentration of manpower, with the peak years employing 450,000 people in various capacities. The space race cost America well over $25 billion. However, the effort led to unequaled progress in American technological development that continued to be exploited and expanded upon throughout the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. For the Soviets, the space race proved to be one of the contributing factors in the demise of the country, as its political and economic systems were unable to cope with such a massive effort. Following the breakup of the old Soviet empire and the collapse of communism, Russia and its space agency are in a state of bankruptcy. The economy has crumbled, and the Russians are barely able to maintain their aging Mir space station, depending entirely upon the sponsorship and support of foreign countries, including the United States. In striking contrast to the space race, a new philosophical climate exists where the success of future space exploration now depends on international cooperation, as no one nation is either willing or able to support such endeavors independently. An international space station is also to be built by the United States in collaboration with the Russians and other countries. Prophetically, in 1965, cosmonauts Alexei Leonov and Pavel Belyaev, who once competed toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States in the lunar space race, foresaw the inevitability of meeting and working with Americans in space on a space station, not as enemies or competitors, but as partners. We have never objected to friendship uh, in uh, resolving our common task of uh, mastering outer space. And I always see Earthmen as all Earthmen as one big family and we must all work together like one family because we shall then go off to other worlds and there will be uh, representatives of many nations aboard and so we must be friends.